Good evening. Welcome to the Wyndham Raymond School District Board of Directors meeting. It is Wednesday, March 6, 2024. Time is 6.30 p.m. and we are in the Wyndham High School Auditorium. May I have a roll call, please? Christina Small. Here. Jessica Bridges. Here. Jenny Butler. Here. Jody Carroll. Here. Caitlin Downs. Here. Marge Gavoni. Here. Joe Kellner. I'm here. Char Jewell. Here. Mike McClellan. Here. Lily Nugent. Here. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? We don't have any adjustments to the agenda tonight. Okay. Now is the time for public input. The purpose of public input is to provide an opportunity to address the board on matters specific to our schools and educational matters. All other comments beyond that scope are not appropriate for this meeting. The board will listen carefully to all members of the public but will not respond. Speakers are expected to follow rules of common decency and decorum. Interrupting any speaker or board member during commentary is not allowed. We ask that all speakers address the board, not the audience. Each person will be permitted to address the board one time during public comment with a maximum speaking time of three minutes. Sharing time with another speaker is not permitted. I will alert the speaker at the three minute mark. If speakers do not complete their comments within the allotted three minutes, they may submit a written statement to the board. Written statements are also accepted from those who do not wish to speak publicly. Requests for information or concerns that require further research will be noted and referred to the superintendent for further action if necessary. Discussion of matters involving individual students is not permitted during public comment due to the privacy, confidentiality, and due process rights of any RSC 14 student. Comments regarding any individual staff, either by name or specifically identifiable by position, are not permitted. If the comment continues, the mic will be turned off. Complaints about any district employee should follow the process outlined in policy KEB public complaints about school personnel and are not permitted during public comment. We ask that adults share their first and last name in the town they reside in. Students are only required to share their first name. Would anybody like to speak? Seeing none, I will close public comment and we will move on to superintendent report. Thank you, I have a couple things to share tonight with the board. Uh, first of all, I probably most of you saw that, but Four o'clock this afternoon, we sent out an updated notice for COVID and COVID protocols. Uh, recently, the CDC put out a memo changing the recommendations to schools and other entities for uh, how we handle positive cases of COVID. And really the bottom line is this, is that as long as students and staff are at least 24 hours fever free without the use of fever redu reducing medications, um, then we can go ahead and skip the five-day quarantine period and have individuals come back. It's still suggested that individuals who are in that um, transition phase uh, still wear a well-fitting mask while they're working their way through that, but changes that five-day quarantine period that all of us, I think, have become used to. So uh, that went out to the community and that went out to all staff members this afternoon. And uh, moving forward, that will be our protocol. And uh, if anyone has any questions who may be watching this tonight, please feel free to reach out to any of the school nurses and they can help with answer any questions or if individuals are unsure whether or not they should either return to work or to school, um, they are a great resource for you. Uh, for board members, uh, there is a budget change that I'm gonna be giving you an updated sheet for your notebooks tonight when we get into budget. Uh, we noticed an error last week that was an error in my presentation and an error in the cover sheets, which is that uh, Ms. PV at RES has an additional teaching position uh, that was neglected within the, the, um, the cover sheets. It was in the budget and it was in the budget that I presented to you last week. Uh, so there's no new cost associated with it, uh, but it was missed on one of the cover sheets for an additional position. So. When we get into budget tonight, I will go ahead and I will hand those sheets down and you can uh, replace under, I don't remember which cost center RES is, but replace your cover sheet and, and go ahead and do that. Uh, board members on your desks, you actually have an invitation, I believe, to the uh, Regional One Act Festival. Uh, there is a typo on the front page. I don't think this actually was generated in RSU 14. I just wanna say that up front, but um, 
It's exciting that once again, Wyndham High School this weekend will be hosting the One Act Festival. And if you've never had the opportunity to go to a One Act Festival, it is a bunch of fun. Uh, I think we have either seven or eight different high schools that will be coming here. They will be judged, and whoever the winners are that come out of that will then go on to the state One Act Festival. Uh, what's really kind of fun about it, though, is that Wyndham High School is going to be filled with uh, kids that love theater and One Acts and families from all around um, the state. And it's also great to see that the, the camaraderie and the fun that kids have as they're cheering each other on and cheering on the different plays that happen uh, during that time period. So if you have nothing to do this weekend, actually I think it's supposed to start raining mid-afternoon on Saturday, which is right at the time that Wyndham High School will be going on at 2.30. So if um, you get that morning sun and get your raking in, great time to come out in the afternoon and see um, our Wyndham High School kids who are doing an old time theater show uh, as their one act play this year. So a bunch of fun if you get a chance to do that. Uh, just obviously want to throw out congratulations to uh, Wyndham High School boys basketball team. So first of all, and actually I'm glad I included my budget. That's the reason they won over the weekend. <laughs> but no, it was great to um, obviously have boys team go ahead that's their first time they've ever been to a state championship game in the history of the school uh, but then to win and to win with incredible uh, athleticism and poise and to represent their school really really well in that game and so obviously congratulations to them um, also congratulations to Chad and Noah and George and Jeff who are the four coaches who've worked with that group of individuals um, did some outstanding coaching this year in order to be able to um, get to that high level and to become AA champions. And I know it was kind of funny having conversations last week with uh, Wyndham High School being the northern main champ, playing Gorham, who was the southern main champ. Uh, but that dividing line for enough large AA schools is the Presumpscot River for north and south. So incredible achievement. and. Um, the gold ball is somewhere in this building, but um, we'll eventually make it to the trophy case and congratulations to the boys. And also I mentioned last week, um, we had two young ladies and I wanna make sure I recognize their names, Ashley Cloutier and Chloe Poitras, who are first ever girls hockey champions uh, for Wyndham High School. We've never been to a state final in girls hockey uh, and we've never had a state champion. So we'll be looking forward to updating the banners uh, for both and also we will be inviting the boys basketball team and our hockey champions to a future board meeting where they can be recognized um, by the board. Uh, we did not have any state champions in wrestling or in track, but we did have some individuals who went to New England's in both and scored very, very well and represented our community well. Um, so congratulations to all those individuals. Uh, tonight we're back into budget and tonight we're gonna be hearing from some of the uh, central office cost centers and again, it's a good opportunity for the board to kind of dig in and look at where we are in the absolute, in the budget process. That's what I got. Okay, moving on to board roundtable. Does anybody have anything they'd like to share? Go ahead, Marty. Um, I'm gonna read it because I had to write it down because it was too long and I wouldn't remember. But anyway, um, there is, uh, I don't know if anybody's heard of PowerServe. Uh, PowerServe is associated with the Sebago Young Life. Uh, PowerServe, I think, started it in the high school, few, quite a few, shaking her head over there, uh, <laughs> quite a few years ago. And what it is, is it's a group of volunteers. Oh. God, I thought it was so loud. It is a group of uh, students and a group of volunteers. Um, if uh, you go to their website, you can find there is a place that you can uh, ask for if you need uh, yard work done, if you know you need help doing things. There is, <clears throat> excuse me, one day that they do it coming up. It's April 27th from 8.30 in the morning till one o'clock. Um, they are looking, the reason I'm bringing it up is they are looking for volunteers. Um, they usually get quite a few requests that come in for, for people who need some work done for them and um, the more volunteers they can get the better. Uh, if it's the first hundred people, you get a free T-shirt. I do remember that. Um, and then afterwards, there is a barbecue. And I don't remember, and Lillian probably knows where it is. I don't know where that's at. 
um, but it's probably on their website. Um, so the whole thing is about giving back to the community. And um, so the biggest thing I guess I'm bringing it up for is that they need the volunteers um, to be able to do the work and help the help that really comes in from other people. So you can sign up as an individual, a family, or a team. Uh, you can either go to their Facebook page or you can go to their website, which is www.powerserve.me. Um, so I would like to let everybody at home know if you're interested and you have the time. Uh, it's a, it, from what I've heard, it's a fun time, even though it is work. Um, so please check into it, and if you have the time, please help. That's all I have. Anyone else? Go ahead, Jenny. We got our, I got an update from Adult Ed regarding their enrollments over the, comparing pre-COVID to now and revenues, and I will be sending that out to the, all of the board members, but there's certainly, Adult Ed is doing much better, especially in, in um, context of COVID in the midst of this a few years ago. So they're doing quite well, and I'll send that out. Okay, anyone else? Okay, we can move on to committee reports. Finance? Our next meeting is scheduled for next Wednesday, March, Wednesday, March 13th at 5.30. Thank you. Facilities? Um, we do not have anything scheduled, and I don't know if, if Chris at this point wants to do a middle school update. I can just take a minute to do that. For, so uh, the middle school building committee is meeting tomorrow night. Uh, and they are going to be looking at um, schematic designs for the new building and basically as this building is starting to come to shape to um, all those final pieces as far as layout, classroom layout, door layout, window layout, all those other pieces and also is going to get a first peek at the designers um, look at what the inside might take a look at, it might look like uh, the other day we had a chance to meet and uh, the theme that's been chosen at this moment that the committee will have a chance to take a look at is recognizing because really looking at how do you bring Wyndham and Raymond together and really what we have in common is a lot of uh, bodies of water and lakes and streams and brooks and so uh, fifth grade at this point, fifth grade teams will all be named after brooks, sixth grade teams will all be named after rivers. Uh, seventh grade teams will be ponds and eighth grade teams will be lakes and so looking at there have been um, six streams brooks ponds lakes combinations from Raymond and six from Wyndham uh, and it's made for some pretty cool names and it's been kind of a neat organizer and celebrating um, some great bodies of water within both of our communities and then the larger building itself has a great celebration that I've yet to see uh, maybe I'm building it up too much for Sebago Lake, which is definitely a, a common, um, really a gift to both communities. Uh, so that particular piece. On Friday, uh, we have a meeting with the Department of Education, and this is our final site meeting. And if we get approval on Friday, we will go to the State Construction Committee and the State School Board. And once that happens, that's the green light to send the site out to bid. And so right now it looks like we are still on track to send out to bid in late April, early May, which means the possibility still of um, starting at the end of July with initial earthwork and starting to cut in the roads as well as um, ball fields, all those different components. And really what kind of caught my eye last night as we were meeting is um, the campus road is three quarters of a mile. So getting an idea of how large these driveways are, these fields, I know we've been looking at it on paper for so long, uh, but the committee will have a chance tomorrow night to start looking at some of the con conceptual pieces if everything goes well Friday. And then I've been told April 28th is when all schematic design pieces for the building itself will close. They'll get into some construction documents and that will go to DOE later this summer because the building most likely won't go out to bid till December, January. So a lot of things happening, a lot of things happening quickly, uh, and um, looks like still middle of July, we'll be getting ready to break ground. Policy? 
Policies not met since last Monday. We'll meet again on March the 11th and we'll continue our work with JICH. Um, we're gonna also get into, and that's drug and alcohol use by students and GICDA, which would be student code of conduct. So we're driving into those and working through the regulation piece of that with the team and with our administrators right now. And then on the 11th, we'll go through those markups and hopefully wrap that one up and we'll bring that one to you in the next meeting. Curriculum? We don't meet again until April. Okay. Moving on to report of the secretary. May I have a motion, please? I move to approve the minutes from the February 28th, 2024 meeting. Second. Thank you all uh, for discussion. Okay. All those in favor? Motion carries. And now we are at cost center presentations. And first up is Mr. Howell. So I'm going to first of all start by handing down a new cover sheet for Raymond Elementary. And again, there's yours. If you could hand that that way. We're not covering Raymond Elementary tonight, but it's a opportunity to have an updated version within your books. Say that again. Get it tomorrow. Good. Are we good? Okay. Go ahead. So tonight we have the opportunity to hear from four different cost centers. Uh, first cost center is mine. The second is uh, Christine under the assistant superintendent. And um, Lisa Garneau under student services. And then also Christine Hessler under curriculum. And board members, if you're following along in your books for the budget, uh, I'm tab 10, superintendent of schools. And there are, what, 4,500 lines of budget code within RSU 14's budget. Uh, five of them are mine, so it's probably the smallest cost center uh, that is within the budget and not proposing anything different or anything new within the superintendent's cost center line. Uh, that line includes my position and includes uh, Terry, who is my administrative assistant. Uh, I think everyone has heard by now that Terry is going to be retiring at the end of the year, so we'll be filling that position. Uh, the other item that appears within that cost center is my mileage. And the one other item are the dues, fees, and membership, and that's the main school management, main superintendents association, the memberships that I hold not only for myself, but also hold on behalf of the district. Uh, so again, it's one of the easiest cost centers to take a look at uh, without any major changes. And I don't know if there's any individual questions on Cost Center 10, which I would be happy to entertain at this moment. Uh, Chris, I just want to highlight, I, I believe the increases in the health insurance is a placeholder still at the 10%. Yep. And then on supplies, I noticed activity year to date is zero. And just, it's a small line, uh, but just curious why it's zero. At this point, we've been able to get along with what we've had uh, for individual supplies for the office uh, through existing supplies. And it was zero prior year as well. Okay. Yep. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? Well done. <laughs> okay, moving on to Assistant Superintendent's Office. So in the, the Assistant Superintendent Cost Center, you'll notice, I'll jump right into an increase that might have caught your attention. Uh, that's in the Central Services Business Office section. The increase is $300,000. Uh, that's tied to the new paid family and medical leave uh, program that 
um, was established October 25th of last year. Uh, the rulemaking starts this spring, and the uh, Maine Department of Labor is responsible for establishing rules. Uh, the payroll contributions will begin January 1st of next year, but then benefits won't begin until May 1st of the following year. So that gives some time for funds to accumulate, um, hopefully enough time and sufficient funds to accumulate for any future claims and other administrative costs associated with that new program. The next um, increase that you may have noticed is in the regular secondary program, the Raymond Choice increase. Uh, you'll see a $111,000 plus increase in that area. Um, public school tuition is up around 25% in that line and private school tuition up 15%. Uh, we've been under budgeting in that particular area um, and whether it's due to interest in athletics or other, for other reasons, um, folks have been opting for that Raymond Choice option that they have and um, you can see the breakdown there. The decrease of significance uh, is in the major capital debt service, uh, $442,000. That's tied to the Wyndham High School um, paying off the, the debt for this building. Um, and you can see the breakdown there. There are no other significant increases or decreases that I was going to bring forward unless you've got a question about something. Go ahead, March. Um, my, mine is not necessarily. Mine is not necessarily on that, um, and, but actually I was curious because I, I, I'm sure I knew this at one time, but I forgot. I'm, I'm at the very end, but it, it's, it's straightforward. Um, and this is on, do we get reimbursed for any pre-K and Raymond choice? Or any piece of it or a portion of it? I remember for the pre-K, there was some, when okay. it first, from out from the state, there was some part of it that we get reimbursed for? So our pre-K numbers are in our ED-279. They're in our October 1 count. Okay. Uh, we're increasing by an additional four students. That was um, submitted last October, so that should be factored into our ED-279. Okay. And on the uh, Raymond Choice, um, if I remember correctly, I think we pay whatever the cost is per student uh, and I think the excess above that, depending on the school, was sent to Raymond to be built. And I don't know if that's, I don't know how that works anymore. Is that still? Sure. So it's actually, it's, it's an easy calculation. Uh, so first of all, with Raymond Choice, Raymond maintained choice when we became an RSU. So Raymond High School students can choose to go to whatever public or private high school that's approved by Maine Department of Education. Uh, the tuition rate for the high school, um, that they choose to go to, we pay the portion, Raymond is responsible for the portion of any difference between that particular high school and Wyndham High School tuition. That gets billed directly to Raymond. Uh, we have typically budgeted $25,000 as a um, amount that we charge to Raymond and when you look at how we break down um, when we look for our appropriation from Raymond, that $25,000 is included. Any money that's not spent gets refunded back to Raymond. Uh, but what, what Christine had talked about with um, Raymond Choice is that we did see over the last couple of years um, some kids heading to Grainy Gloucester for athletics, which is great if that's the, the high school choice that works for them. And we had been under budgeting the number of kids that we have for Raymond Choice. and so. Really with choice, it's more of a flow through. Mm -hmm. And um, so we get the money, we pay the bills, um, and we just verify the fact that a kid lives in Raymond and that is in fact their choice and, and we handle the paperwork on that part. But that difference marge I think is what you're getting to. Yeah. And I think everyone's aware, last, uh, two years ago, that Chevrolet became an approved, that uh, private religious schools Chevers is an approved school right now, and I'm just trying to think if any of the other, I'm not sure if St. Dom's has been approved yet, but we do have some kids that go to Hebron um, and some kids that go to NYA. In those particular cases, uh, the district pays up to a state qualified tuition amount. I think right now 
right around 12, 6, 12, 8. And anything above that, then the parent has to make up that difference. So if it's $28,000, and for simple math here, 28,000 for NYA, and the district's contributing 12 to Raymond Choice, that difference of um, $16,000 becomes the responsibility of the parent to make that up. Okay, great. I think it's good for the public to know. Go ahead, Jody. I just I asked that same question actually in advance for this budget. So, to be super crystal clear, similar to say food services where they have a separate budget, they have a revenue side and an expense side. It would be helpful to see what the offsetting revenue side is to this because I think and I don't necessarily need to know the number, but I think that the conversation is that that's not an increase. It's money that you're pulling to allocate so that you can give cash to Raymond as more students may choose and we have to pay Raymond. It's not actually an increase though, outside of the deficit between what's covered, what we're reimbursed yeah, for. It's, it's, it's actually a cost to Raymond because uh, when the state looks at, in the EPS formula, when the state looks at the two towns mm -hmm. for fiscal capacity, it looks at Raymond differently than it looks at Wyndham. Uh, those student counts for Raymond Choice go to Raymond and so basic allocation for what Raymond would be required to pay based on X number of students to hit their fiscal capacity, Raymond has billed that amount as far as what the Raymond needs to raise is included within that. There is a difference between what is included in um, the state amount per student and then the um, amount that would be required for tuition, which then goes back to Raymond and then in addition, any tuition amounts between the two uh, go through to be able to track. Uh, and we've ranged anywhere from 29 to I think 54 students that have exercised Raymond Choice. There's roughly 50 kids per grade level, so we, we've kind of fluctuated between 80% of students and 75% of students choosing to come to Wyndham High School uh, through, through Choice. So. Okay. Uh, two quick questions. On the insurance increases, are those actual or projected increases? Insurance increases are um, projected. Okay. This is the year that we are due to, we, let's just back up, it's just for the board, it's good for the board to know and I'm not sure the public knows. Uh, we use a broker for insurance so that that broker looks and shops best insurance for multiple different places. This is the year we go out to bid for everything except for our inland pollution, which is our sewage treatment plant. So we're due to go to bid in May. Those are placeholders that were given us, to us by the insurance company. Uh, property and liability is up. And um, anyone who's watched the news with wildfires, hurricanes, uh, all the different natural disasters that we're seeing, um, as insulated as we think we are, we're still part of the national insurance market and it does impact us. I mean, that's huge, again, for the public, almost a 20% increase, which, I mean, that checks out, can, can confirm. Yep. Um, Christine, can you, I didn't quite follow on the FMLA tax, so mm -hmm. we're starting to accrue for that earlier than it's due, is that what we were saying? So we build up a... Right, you know, so January of, ne of 2025, we'll start and then build that up. It doesn't go into effect until May of the following year, May, May 1st of 2026. Uh, so there'll be some money available should we start to have claims and just the general administrative costs to cover. I so it gives us idea. time. Yeah. Good. Yeah. That makes sense. Thank you. Okay, I had a qu couple questions. You um, talked about the insurance going out to bid in May, but we're pretty close to the end of our budget process at that point. So when will we actually have the number? I don't know how long that process takes. I would need to check to see when those numbers are back. Um, however, based upon what has been predicted in the insurance market and what other places have been getting, I'm going to guess those numbers are going to be pretty close. Okay, so we can't, those are probably not moving, okay. No, I think, I think <laughs> typically where you're going to see any sort of change that is possible is health insurance and we'll know health insurance by either the end of this month or beginning of next. Um, um, my other question was on um, equipment workers comp. So I saw the detail note that was for like ergonomic equipment. I didn't know if that budget amount was for central office staff only or is that district wide? It's district wide. Sorry. That's Mike's budget. Yeah. 
Mike, well, Mike it's Duffy. In her, it's in her cost center. Yes, but that's in my cost center, but Mike Duffy oversees all the workers' comp and it's covered across the district. Well, it was, it's under workers' comp, but it's equipment workers' comp, and it, was, it said it was for ergonomic equipment in the detail, which I thought was a little bit strange under workers' comp, but... It's, it's yes and no, because what, it, what it's designed for is that Mike has been working across the district to reduce workers' comp claims, and so it's furniture purchases to reduce those claims, so that's directly related to reducing our premium and ultimately our mod rate for workers' comp. Sure, so is there a, a process where, you know, a um, group of people get upgraded every year, we kind of rotate through? Because that's not a ton of money for the whole district. It's when, well, I'll give you an example. When we had remote teachers during COVID, uh, there was an assessment done to make sure anyone working from home teaching classes had the right setup. Um, but I think it's as needed. I can double check with Mike on the details, but I think right now it's assessing different folks based on the need arises to take a look at their setup and doing it. We have a gentleman that comes in and does an ergonomic assessment. Okay. It was just interesting because the last three years, there was not a real steady kind of number of what was spent. So like this year, we hadn't used much of that at all. So I didn't know if, you know, maybe at the end of the year is when they might be purchasing that equipment to um, justify kind of the large placeholder we have there versus what we have actually spent this year to date anyway. I realize the school year's not done. No, and I think the other thing to just, we have done so much work in the offices and individuals who don't have a lot of freedom of mobility throughout the work day, uh, and we've been able to address a lot of their issues. I think Mike now has been working towards classroom arrangements and other things, and so just slowly picking away, but it has had an impact on workers' comp and, and the um, ability of staff to be able to do their jobs and avoiding repetitive injuries. Okay, that was all. Are we good with this one? Oh, no, March, go ahead. Um, I just want to make a comment because um, I, I, I think um, we're not following the usual. Usually when we go through this, we say what color page we're on and what the number of the mm -hmm. page is so we can all follow. I mean, I probably started off with it wrong. <laughs> So if we could go back to that, I think that'll help us all, so we all know where, we're, where the other one is at. <laughs> all right, I think we're ready to move on to um, student services with Lisa Garneau. Chris, I don't know what tab number I am, because I don't get the whole book. <laughs> I get a little piece. <laughs> Number 30. Thank you, <laughs> Christina. So Margie, that's the tab you need to go to. <laughs> so I'm Lisa Garno. I'm the Director of Student Services. And so for um, those of you that are, are tuning in for the first time or meeting me for the first time um, within Student Services, uh, there's a lot of um, different departments that fall under my budget. So I, the bulk is special education services staff, I, we also service students with 504 plans. Uh, I serve as students who have are uh, multilingual. Uh, we serve students um, who are eligible under the McKinney Vento Act, which is the Homeless Act. I serve as students under the Foster Care Act, uh, and also school nurses and social workers fall under my budget line. So I have a big group that. Um, I encompass and also now I have pre-k special ed so Margie I wanted to just answer your question that you were asking about reimbursement so if you look on my cover sheet for my staff where it lists out um, can move it over here is that better yeah. yeah if you go to my cover sheet for the student services department and you look at the numbers at the very bottom Stacy separated out into 6,700 cost center, the 6,700, do you see that at the bottom? Yeah, so there's a special ed teacher there and there's uh, two ed techs for the pre-K program and those, uh, those positions sit outside the budget because we bill CDS directly for that, so they're working with students with IEPs. So that's a, we pay their salary weekly, but it's a direct capture monthly, we bill CDS and get reimbursed for those staff. So that might have been what you were thinking about when you were asking your question earlier. Does that make sense? Okay. 
So in terms of our department, um, we've tried to stay the course, if you will. Um, we've had a pretty even keel in the um, overall number of students, um, total number of special ed students. It's a kind of an up and down uh, number. But within that, um, we actually have seen an increase in um, the needs of students. So we have a number of um, high need students that will be entering school in the fall. And as a result of that, um, what we're going to need to do is to be adding um, one special ed teacher at uh, Wyndham Primary School to help with the influx of the students coming into the K program um, from CDS. So we're looking at about 60 or 62 students right now out of the incoming kindergarten class who will, who will have IEPs. So in order for us to be compliant, we need to have another teacher there. Um, the next thing that is uh, really risen to the table um, over the post-COVID is really um, students with behavioral challenges and everything from as simple, um, you know, to wiggly ADHD kids to students who have more complex um, behavior and emotional needs related to a mental health diagnosis. And as we look at the needs of the district, um, one of we've been really successful with the coaching model. And so for those of you that don't know, I have a special ed academic coach. Uh, Christine has some regular ed coaches. And that model of I do, we do, you do, um, and being able to be available for staff has been a very positive experience. And so what I would like to propose is that we add a behavior coach under special education for the district. Currently, I contract with a private BCBA, um, but as those of you know, um, when we contract with people, they're only available for a certain number of days, um, for certain periods of the day, and kids don't always seem to misbehave on those days they're present. So by eliminating um, that position that I contract with and having a full-time position in district, that will help to better meet the needs of the, the district pre-K-12, really. Um, and so how that would work is in the, in my budget line, I also have a, a grant where I'm able to pay some money out of. And so I um, would um, move an uh, out-of-district tuition. So when you look in your out-of-district tuition lines, you'll see a reduction of $50,000. So I would move $50,000 out of the local budget to the grant um, to cover that tuition. And then that would offset the cost of this position. And then the last sort of position we're asking for is, um, again, as we look at our middle school, and this would include both Jordan Small and Wyndham Middle, and then Wyndham High School, um, we're seeing an increase in students who need support for uh, not only um, their emotional needs, but also substance use. And so I currently have um, in my budget um, day one services, so that for those of you to that don't know that's the um, drug counselor that is in district. And so it's about 22,300, I think, for 350 for the middle school and 49,000 for the high school. And what I would propose is that we eliminate the day one contract and hire a social worker that's designated for the middle school high schools who has the drug counseling um, license along with their social work license. So that's really the, um, you know, the, the sort of the big, there's a lot of net. So three new positions, um, but offset through um, either the local budget or the grant to be able to pay for that. Questions? Go ahead, Char. Uh, so a couple of questions. Sure. So um, you talk about in your um, opening here, that the growing number of students that are multilingual. Yes. Can you characterize for us um, how that's changed over the last few years? Yeah, so um, bear with me just a minute, uh, Shar, because I did bring those numbers. So um, in chatting with the um, ML teachers uh, recently, they shared uh, current numbers with me. And so we are currently at 63 students who receive uh, multilingual services. When we look at um, that 63, 55 are identified for direct instruction. So that's based on their access score, which is through the WIDA. 
And so there's we're, we have an ML team that's working together to take a look at how we've delivered services across the district in the past. And so what we're finding is we have a lot of new students, like we, we call them newcomers, um, you know, who have no English at all. And so not only do they need to learn English, like phonetically think about your own children, you know, as you're teaching the alf um, English alphabet and the sounds, those don't, those don't correspond to the their native language. And so the, the need is not only in the numbers of students that has increased. I think, I think, Char, when I came nine years ago, we were somewhere between, I'm going to say six to 12 stu ML students. And I think when I presented to you all like two years ago, I think we were at like 40 something. And so we have seen this influx, of, continuous influx of, of uh, students, um, which we're excited to have them. They bring a you know super cool uh, diversity to our district, but we also want to make sure that they're receiving the instruction that they, that they need. And are these students spread all over all of the grades, or are they kind of bubbled in certain um, They're spread across, actually. Uh, the, the biggest group would be at Wyndham High School at 17. Manchester has 14, Wyndham Primary has 12, Wyndham Middle 8, and then Jordan Small 2. Okay. So. Uh, my second question is, um, in, in here you, you talk about um, an intake of large number of students with autism. Mm -hmm. So kind of the same question, Yeah. Um, different group, is how has that changed over the last few years? Yeah, so I my first year here in this district was 2014, and so I started keeping tabs on the, on the categories from our October 1 count. And in 2014, we had 41 students identified with autism. As of October um, of this year, 23, we had 75 identified with autism. We've probably had another since October, I'm gonna say probably five to six students identified with autism. And we're projecting somewhere between 22 and 25 incoming with autism. Wow. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Joe. Thanks, Lisa. A couple uh, quick questions. Just on sure. the staffing changes. So you have a decrease of two FTEs in EdTech 3. Just wondering to what we attribute that. Is it unable to fill positions or something? Yeah, so actually my net, my overall net EdTechs is the same, is still the same. Um, what typically we have in the past hired EdTech 3s, but we actually have been able to hire, given the staffing shortage, because I 10 open ed tech positions right now. We've um, hired some ed tech twos, which have been a great addition. And then we also um, have hired, we have partnered with um, surrounding districts um, like uh, Gorham and Bonnie Eagle, and we're actually partnering with um, SMCC, and they're doing an ed tech intern apprentice program. So um, the, I have one person participating in that as an ed tech one. So um, when Stacy ran the budget, the numbers based on what existing staff are, but when we actually do the budget, at, like the salaries are holding there, but that's the reason why. It's a net um, of one, I think, where we, we really are. Okay, thank you for that. And on the self-contained teacher, kind of the same question. I'm guessing that's offset by the increase in special ed teachers, but. Yeah, and so, yeah, just because I think this is your first time around, what, um, there are three codes basically in special ed, like 2100, 2200, and 2300. And 2100 is for the students who are in the regular education classroom more than 60%. Uh, 2200 is those, like what we call resource room students, and that's why it shows on your budget. And those are the kids that are in the regular ed, like 40% to 59%. And then anybody who's in the special education setting less than 40% would be 2300 or self contained. And so as students move in and out, I mean, we always want kids in our least restrictive environment. So. I tend to look at my net of 32 special ed teachers that has stayed the same for a long time. Depending upon what their assignment is from year to year, we have to code them with the state. So that's why you're seeing the change in, in numbers. It's just where what the needs of the district are. Thank you, that's helpful mm -hmm. um, for sure. I, I also just want to call out, I really appreciate seeing the increase in social work. Uh, and we, there's been a lot of conversation in the community right. and here about the need for social work in the schools. I still question whether we have enough, uh, but I, I wanted to call that out. So if Just you want to give me more oh. money, I'm happy to bring <laughs> that back to the A team to talk about the need for social workers. I, I, <laughs> I think it's a I think it's an important conversation to have yeah. to make sure we have the right supports. Yeah. Obviously, we have to 
responded. But. Yeah, I think it's also helpful. I don't know if the public knows or if you all know, but you know, the, the going rate right now is one in five students with autism. Um, it's also, I was just in a webinar last month with a, a national psychologist who was presenting and their Boston Children's Hospital just put a study out last month that there are one in five students under the age of 10 who are now diagnosed with a significant mental health diagnosis, which is, I've been doing this 30 years, that's pretty high. That's right. So. My last question is, is again, a newbie question, which all of them are, I suppose. Do we do anything in our budget? Um, I'm not sure if you can answer, Chris, you may need to answer, as far as a vacancy factor goes. Do we, after we budget the number of FTEs, do we predict that some of those are gonna go vacant through the year, or do we budget at 100%? We, we budget with the hope of going 100% and having the ability to go to 100%. Um, I thought you actually were going to a different direction. Where do we budget for a hiring rate? Uh, we typically go five to 10 years of experience for teachers and ed techs. Uh, and then see where we land for when we have turnover like that. But no, we, we budget that these are the positions that we need and um, that we're hoping to fill all of them. Thank you. Yep. Thank mm -hmm. you. Anyone else? Go ahead, Jody. I just have a, a comment more than anything else. I want to piggyback on what Joe said about the social work piece last year. We ended up getting a bit of a kick on the ED 279 at the end, and certainly um, as a team, it I'm not sure if we've talked about this, forgive me if I missed it, but just that wish list. So, hey, health insurance came in at 8%, whatever the number is. Can we see what, you know, what, what does Lisa want? You know, mm -hmm. we're talking about social workers. I'm sure we've had some conversations about a few wish list items in our presentations in February, just round table. Um, but I'm interested to see what that looks like when it's the right time. Um, and support that social work piece. I just want to commend you for the work that you've done. I know it's a full team effort right. across all the buildings. Um, but you're dealing with some very complicated issues with some um, kiddos that have high, high needs. Yeah. And um, certainly as a team, I hope that we see that. Um, if we've not been in the classroom, you know, it's different than it used right. to be. Even when my kiddo who's now in grade five started in kindergarten in this district, it's very different in a classroom now than it was even you know, three, four, five years ago. Um, and these resources, even though it may not fit into a typical mold of what a school should supply, the teachers, in my view, can't teach if they don't have the ability to intervene for the students that are not able to attend to learn. So I so want to commend you for that work yeah, and certainly you. as a team um, that we see what is can be given on the wish list if there's resources that are available after the estimates come in for health insurance and other things. So. Yeah. Thank so you. on that note, uh, Jody, I appreciate you saying that. I would also like to end with thanking my team. For those of them are, that are watching, it, you're right. It takes a village. And I cannot tell you how blessed I feel to be in this district. Um, I've worked in many in my career. This board is very supportive. The community is very supportive. But at the end of the day, my job is easy to advocate because we have such good staff in place. So for all the special ed teachers, related service providers, and ed techs who are watching tonight, we couldn't do it without you. So thank you for saying that. I had a couple of questions. Oh, you do? Um, okay, perfect. I thought I was all done, Christina. No. <laughs> Sorry, I'll be quick. Okay, um, so of your nine special ed teaching positions, are those all filled or any of those vacant? Um, if you'd like to know the vacant positions, I have that list as well. And so currently, um, in addition to the 10 ed tech openings we have, we have five special ed teacher, teaching positions open across the district. And I have one uh, site coordinator position at Wyndham Primary that's still open. Okay, so of the nine FTE special ed teachers, five of those are vacant. Is that what I heard? Um, the total, out of the 32 total special ed teachers, five are vacant. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, we're not that, that bad yet. <laughs> I still have people coming to work. <laughs> yeah. No, and some of those are, um, a couple of those positions are, are positions that have been vacated that, you know, we have people filling the roles. Um, okay. But, right. Um, my other question, so your, your behavior specialist, your additional one that you're asking for for this year, did you say that was um, district-wide or is that gonna be housed in a building somewhere? Um, we would love to have it be district-wide similar to what uh, Melissa Bois does as a special ed coach. Okay. We, we have sort of a, if this all comes to fruition, we have a plan. Uh, we've got a group of people who'll be working together, but yeah. Okay. We have and a starting place. 
And my last question um, was tuition to public schools. So I understand why um, on occasion we send students to special purpose private schools and mm -hmm. that's not something we can provide service here. But I was wondering why. Is there one, is it 18,000? Is that the one that's 18,900? Or is it different? Oh, okay, so I'm on page 39. Of okay, thank you. Let me go to that page, hold on. <laughs> so it's tuition to public schools special ed. Yes, I think, hold on one So second. again, private school, completely understand. I was just yep. didn't understand why we would send one of our students to another public school. Hold on, I just have to find where you it's are. It's under special ed programs, regular classroom placement. I don't know that my 39 matches up with your 39. Chris, do you see where she's talking? What number, how much? Yeah, she's on, she's on page 39 of 77, Lisa. This actually. Oh, a white page, sorry. Purple. I thought they were numbered together, I apologize. 39. This might be your Raymond special It is, class. yeah. The um, tuition to public schools is 18,900. Yeah, that is, so it's very similar to the tuition for um, the regular ed. So if a student in Raymond exercises um, school choice, um, that so for example if a student were to go to gray and they had special ed services gray can bill less for the special ed services so we pay that and then stacy does her magic on the other side but i have to have a placeholder in the local okay budget. so it's it's part of uh, raymond choice yes okay perfect that was all thank you very much thank you. Okay. all right we are all ready set. to move on okay. um to thank curriculum you. instruction and assessment with christine hessler Uh oh. Hi, good evening. Um, Christine Hessler, Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. Does this seem really loud now? No. Oh, okay. That's fine. It's echoing really loud back here, so, but it's okay. Um, Tonight I'm prepared to talk about my budget. Uh, my district mission is um, basically helping the tools for our teachers to deliver great instruction. Um, one of the great things that you have heard on and off for the year is the work that the curriculum committee has done because that gives us an opportunity to dig a little bit deeper into a content area or a teaching strategy and then your committee gets to um, report to the board. So. Two specific things that we have been working on this year, you've heard multiple times that we are focused on updating the new main, main learning results for English language arts, PE and health, um, and art and music. So all of those new standards will be into Infinite Campus and our curriculum guides will all be updated and posted this summer. Um, we are also doing a year long focus on the science of reading. Um, we have had teachers, uh, 21 teachers, who have gone through Letters 1 training, and we have other trainings that we have scheduled that we're starting actually in about another week. Um, so we are transitioning to the science of reading, which is an incredible opportunity for our staff to learn. Um, I offered a resource today if people wanted it early, and I had 30 people email me um, that they wanted their stuff early before even next fall. So it's a great opportunity um, to extend some learning of our staff. Um, next year, we will continue to um, provide best practices for reading and writing um, through materials, through modeling, through coaching. Um, and we will also support, um, even though it's not reflected in my budget, um, my department will also be helping on the new mentoring program for new staff. So that's another big project that we kind of put our bubble um, on for next year. So my cost center lines, um, I do have an increase this year and that is due to the iReady diagnostic and materials. Um, for those of you that are new on the board, when we had ESSER funds, we were able to pay up front for three years of all the materials and all of the software lines that is now expired. Um, and so I kind of been warning saying it's coming back, it's back for this budget season. So you will see an increase in all of the school's lines. Um, Bob will also talk about that increase when it comes to technology. Um, there is also an increase, and this again is gonna show in Mr. Hickey, so I'm, I, I feel bad he kind of gets all the bad news. Um, but we have piloted and we have implemented um, a software called NewsELA, um, which provides our middle school staff 
with nonfiction articles at four different reading levels. So for example, if you are studying ecosystems in science and you have all the learners in your classroom, they can get the same article but written at a different reading level for those students um, so that everybody can have the same experience. Um, and so that can be used across English language arts, it can be used with social studies, and it can also be used um, with science, which is a really great resource that teachers have been clamoring um, to have that updated material. So that's a little bit of an increase. Um, significant decrease, um, unfortunately, our elementary tech integrator, Susie, um, was offered an incredible opportunity um, to go to the corporate field and work from home, um, and she did take that position. Um, that position um, is going to be reallocated um, into the high school, um, and you'll hear more about that from Ryan Karen, but that's the decrease in my, my budget lines. So I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Go ahead. Just out of curiosity, why doesn't gifted and talented fall under student services? Wouldn't offering services to those students who need to be challenged just as important as offering resources to those who need more resources? Like, isn't it a student service? It is student services. It's under Lisa's budget. Oh, I'm sorry. Gifted and talented is under my budget. Mm -hmm. You're right. Correct. Because the way that the grant is written, um, from the state, so I fill out a grant every year with our information for our teachers and we get reimbursed for their salaries and pieces. So. Oh, yep. Caitlin, it's a great question. It, it varies district to district. Some right. districts have it under the special ed director, student services director, and some people put it under the curriculum director. Um, but they're both serving the same function and they both have to follow the same set of rules from DOE. Mm -hmm. But there are some districts where that's where it falls and some like RSU 14 mm -hmm. traditionally has fallen. It all depends on who writes the grant and does the paperwork for, for that for the states. It's a great question. Thank you. Thanks. I was hoping you could tell me um, of your Title I ed techs, how many of those, do we have some federal funded and then some locally funded? Can you just tell me the numbers there? Uh, nope. <laughs> Can you email me them later? Um, I can, but it's in a revolving door. So um, we are very fortunate with our title funds that we are paying the majority out of them out of grant funding. So for those people that are new or listening at home, I will be coming back to you hopefully in May um, with our allocated amount for Title I and how we intend to spend those funds. So anything that does not cover our Title I staff um, we usually use locally. Right now, um, and for the coming year, Raymond Elementary will not qualify as Title I. They have not the past couple of years, so we pay for those locally. So we've been able to cover about everything else in the Wyndham area, because Manchester School is a Title I school, and Wyndham Primary School is a Title I school. So. Okay. I think we're all set. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, and we are ready to move on to uh, approving the district school calendar. May I have a motion, please? I move to approve the 2024-2025 district school calendar. Second. For discussion? Go ahead. I just want to give a shout out for to uh, Scott McLean and Pete Hensler that we finally <laughs> did it. Yay! For one year. <laughs> All those in favor? Motion carries. Next up, policies. May I have a motion, please? I move to approve the second reading of policy IJJL, library material selection. Second. Thank you. Public comment? Board discussion? Sure. Um, so I did, I did uh, review the policies that, as they've been rewritten, and, um, and I appreciate greatly the amount of time and effort that the policy committee put into them. Um, but I want to share a few thoughts. Uh, recently, a parent shared that they were asked to sign a permission slip for their high school student to watch an R-rated movie in one of their classes. She said that if she didn't give permission for her student to watch the R-rated movie, that the student would be sent to the library for the duration of the movie. She then expressed dismay that her student, who was not given permission to watch an R-rated movie, 
would then have access to various materials in the library she deems inappropriate for her student. While the library material selection policy does allow for a parent to restrict their child's ability to access certain library materials, it only allows for a note to be placed in the online library catalog system, which will restrict the student from borrowing the identif identified material. In no, way, in no way does this restrict the student from accessing the inappropriate materials while in the library. The policy also covers that uh, members of the public have the ability to review library materials. Um, it is unreasonable to expect that parents and community members can keep up with the contents of the library. We should be able to trust that the materials selected in the library uphold our commonly held cultural morals. Under the policy, librarians in consultation with the administrators have the discretion to add or remove materials from the library collections. They evaluate the collection continuously to ensure the materials support standards, curriculum, and diverse learning needs. While the proposed IJJL-R requires discussion with administration on whether materials are listed on the ALA challenge book list of the most recent year, there was no directive behind this requirement to disincentivize the addition of, the, of this material. In essence, the librarian and administration have sole authority, with the board's authorization, to add or remove any materials they wish. We can't control what students are exposed to outside of school, but we absolutely should control what they are provided to inside school. Even after all these years of discussing library material selection, listening to everyone's perspectives, I still don't understand how books that would be classified as R or even X-rated if it was a movie is acceptable materials for our student libraries. How does access to R or X-rated materials set up our students for success? Thank you. Jenny, did I see your hand or no? No. Go ahead, Jody. Uh, so I appreciate the sentiment, and I think I'll probably just uh, respond by at least acknowledging um, that there's just some things that I wrote something as well. We just couldn't get to some of some of those things uh, from a policy perspective. It doesn't mean that they're not valid, and that the whole district doesn't have to take responsibility for them. Um, so I think they're fair. I'm going to support the policy as it goes um, tonight, just because I know that we've done a good job. And the first thing I wanted to ask the team tonight was if you thought it was okay. I watched our meeting back last week and I was trying to think of the experience from the public's perspective if they didn't attend our workshop, which no one did. We don't record the workshop and we did do a fairly robust job of reviewing the work that we did on these policies. And where we started from, the problems we wanted to address as well as the process and then you know really our goals and how we we came up with the two policies the exhibits and and the regulation and so i guess as a team if i just wanted to ask if if we could get a consensus to provide an outline of that document to the public at least because what we discussed last week was a skeleton of the work that's been done and i don't know if i was somebody watching that back without having touched this for a while through last year's process, it would uh, pay homage, I think, to the work that has been done and where we landed. Um, is, is there a way for us to, I mean, does anyone have any thoughts on that? We had discussed putting it with the minutes of the policy committee, yep. if I understand. So it's not there yet, but it is going to land public facing on our website. Okay. Where I thought you were going is I thought you wanted to outline some of that right now. No. Okay. No, not at all. And I, I guess um, I have a few comments. Sure, you've already made a couple of them, so I'll skip through, but um, I just wanted to, to note a couple things, and I don't want to just say doom and gloom, and I, I will vote to support this going uh, for the library policy, but there are a few issues that we weren't able to address with this policy that I think are important to point out. Uh, we weren't able to add um, exclusionary criteria for the selection of materials in this policy. We did talk about it as a team and uh, specifically materials that contain content that's rated poorly and he with heavy caution uh, by Common Sense Media, something that we use in the district regularly for digital citizenship in the categories as they break out of educational value, positive messages, positive role models, 
violence and scariness, sex, romance and nudity, language products and purchases, and finally drinking, drugs and smoking. And those are the categories that books get evaluated from common sense media. Um, so that's the first thing is that we didn't have anything um, that reflected our ability to say, even if one of our reference materials said, this is a poor quality material, that we would um, put in something in our policy that says, if that was the case under any of these co categories, that we would not add that to our catalog. Um, so I think that's a weakness in the policy. We do not have the ability to limit exposure of young students to materials that are rated for a higher age as we're obligated by established legal precedent to ensure that we do respect the right of access to all students that are in the school who have access to the library. This inability to restrict the access by age results in our youngest readers in those buildings having access to materials that our library media specialists and librarians rightly so have selected for older readers within that same building. And that's just something that we, we discussed at our workshop as well. Um, the opt-out loophole, Char talked about, so I'll skip over that. Um, and then it, I think finally it's important that we as a board don't discount the importance of the broader issue. And it's not so much just that there are books in the library um, and that it, they can access this material in their mobile homes at, phones at home or in different areas of their life. I think it's a, it's a bigger picture issue from my perspective, um, continuing to consistently evaluate and filter materials coming out of the district with a view to uphold the values, the morals, ethics, et cetera, that we expect of our students. So we hand specific, really prescriptive policies. We're working on a bunch right now around bullying, hazing, sexual harassment, student code of conduct that hold our students to a high standard and describe the type of citizen we desire them to be while they're attending the schools in our district. And the materials we select have to be consistent with these expectations. And I think that it's more than fair to say that there have been materials pointed out to us that haven't come to the challenge to the board that don't reflect that. When an individual parent might take the, you know, the they might make the choice to allow their youth to consume this content at home, the materials selected to be consumed at school should meet all the selection criteria in our list and our policies. And further, we should, not be adding content and continue to deselect materials with strong warnings. We should continue to deselect things that have strong warnings and continue to look at that crew method that we added in our policy that our library media specialists follow. We have to look at the trusted resources, references, and site, such as Common Sense Media, that champion a high quality uh, set of materials for youth in our material collections. We as a board share the burden of ensuring our students have the highest quality education and the selection of the materials, whether they be movie titles, uh, books, et cetera, under both of these policies is critical to achieving that outcome. And I think that that's something I just wanted to say as a, to the team to say, we did a good job with the policies, but there's an overarching idea here that, that comes not only from the board, but all the way down to the selection of the materials and the policy doesn't touch that piece of it. Um, so I just want to at least echo and respond. Um, incidentally, I had some of the same, same bits of feedback. So. Anyone else? Go ahead, Caitlin. Um, and I also agree with, I think that everyone has worked really hard on these policies. I think it's a very difficult topic that we're working through. Um, I did spend the whole day reading all the emails that we got, you know, dating back to last year about, um, you know, prior to last year when, you know, IJJ had the word obscene in it. And I know that it, we're not able to exclude materials, um, but I don't feel that the policy, the way it's written, really protects our students from seeing obscene materials. Um, so I just wanted to share that I w would not be voting to approve the library um, policies tonight because I think they're still needs to be some work done to make sure obscene materials don't make it in, you know, so we don't have more book challenges because of that. Just think it needs to continue to be addressed. Thank you. Go ahead, Marge. Okay. All right. I know there was a lot of work. God bless the policy committees, all I can say. Um, those were uh, open meetings for anybody on the board who wanted to attend it. We did have a workshop on this. We did have a first reading on this. I find it very discouraging that we get to a second, final reading on this policy, and all of, all of you people want to put your input in now. If you had put it in sooner, as much as the policy had already been worked on, maybe something more could have been done. I, I, think, I think this is really coming in the back door, and I, I think it shows very poor respect for what's going on. 
Anyone else? Go ahead, Joe. So I came into this in joining the policy committee toward the end of the conversations on IJJ and splitting IJJ into IJJL and IJJC. And I, I don't have, I guess, the benefit, that doesn't feel like the right word, but the, uh, the experience the rest of the board had um, in working through this policy last year. So I want to acknowledge that. I, I want to share, I think, you know, for the benefit of those perhaps watching at home, some of the things that I learned that I didn't know as we went through this process. And it really has to do with some of the legal precedents. My, my hope in looking at this policy was that there was some sort of meet in the middle solution for uh, certain scenarios we might face. No problem, thank you. Uh, my hope was that there was some sort of meet in the middle solution for some of the problems we might face. You know, for example, as, as Jody spoke to, you know, there, there's a big difference in maturity between somebody entering high school and somebody exiting high school. And an appropriate material for somebody who's leaving high school is not necessarily an appropriate material for somebody who's entering high school. The way the law is that we are faced with, it does not give us the leeway to make that determination within a single building. And you know, some of the things the public asked about last year I'm not sure that the answer was necessarily clear at no fault of anybody's. You know, there, there were some people that suggested certain materials <coughs> be placed in certain places within the school or, or only accessible under certain conditions. And I'm, I'm persuaded, at least in the material that I've reviewed, that those aren't actions that we can take as a board. It's, it's purely binary. Uh, it's, it's keep the material or eliminate the material, um, at least as, as the law is today. Uh, so I found that, you know, again, for lack of a better word, a bit frustrating that we don't have the ability to kind of work through innovative solutions to what are perhaps real problems. I think we're always going to struggle with, with different philosophies and morals and trying to apply that universally across the board. I think that's going to be something that uh, this board and uh, school boards across the country struggle with um, in perpetuity. I think the policy is well written uh, as is. I'll, I'll certainly be supporting it. I think a lot of thought and work went into it. As we look at the inclusion criteria uh, that are there, I think that can be a bit uh, difficult to digest, I suppose, in that it needs to meet some, not necessarily all. And that's something that I mentioned in our workshop that I hope we can think about in a future policy revision. I don't know that we can correct it now because I, I don't have any suggestions on how we would necessarily correct <coughs> it, but I hope we can come up with a way to say that you know, materials must meet these things and should meet these things, or something along those lines. Right now, it's very subjective in, in how we evaluate a material that meets the criteria and don't meet the criteria. But I don't know, you know, that I'll use this a lot in my favorite Churchill quote, the worst option except all the others in front of us right now uh, is, what, is what we are faced with. Uh, I do think this substantially improves the process compared to how it was applied previously. And I think it adds a lot more transparency for the public on how, how the policy is applied when a challenge is brought forth. Uh, and I think that's a good thing. Um, and I think we need to recognize the improvement that's there as well. So I'll leave it there. Thanks for the opportunity to come in. Go ahead, Mike. Might as well, huh? Mm -hmm. um, boy, I could say a lot on this, and I won't. Um, so I'm actually on the committee. Uh, I'd apologize. I've been, I've been pretty sick. I've missed meetings recently. And I also came in midterm, right? I, you guys have done a ton of work before I ever showed up to it. Um, and Joe, I forget the word you used, but my word was polar, that this discussion is such a polar issue. I work in Augusta, I work with the legislature. I was at a bill yesterday, it went past midnight, that was horrible. And it's just the way our culture is right now. So I'm gonna support this because I know the work that was done. It's not very satisfying. Part of me is like, can we put a star next to it and say, we're gonna bring this back. You know, we're not gonna wait 20 years to do this again. Um, and I, I, have a, I have a real concern, and I don't, have, I don't know what to do, and maybe someone else is here. There's a, there are a lot of studies coming out about the brain you know, in the last year, last two years, uh, and just the, the effects, activities, like say premarital sex, how it changes your brain. And this is really, you know, and I'm not a scientist, so I'm really concerned, you know, for this issue, and I, I don't have an answer for it. Uh, this is a very unsatisfying process, and yet you led a really good process. I mean, it was a lot of hard work, 
I commend you for that. And I think, as you said, maybe there's not really a good answer at this point, but I, I do hope we bring it back and we, you know, we start it and say, yeah, we're going to keep watching this one. So, thank you. Um, I just want to start by acknowledging everybody that worked on this policy in the year that it was in committee. So, you know, more recently, Mike and Joe joined in. I was in the later half of it. Jody sat through all of it. Jess was there for much of it. Of course, Kate Bricks was there for much of it. So a lot of us had our hands in this. Um, the only thing I really want to speak to is the selection criteria. You know, when I came into this, I figured that was going to be the meat of it. And that was one thing that really didn't change. And, um, you know, when I think about policy in general is, is it's most policies, it's very high level. And we have made a very detailed prescriptive policy, maybe one of the most um, prescriptive ones that we've had. And I, there's still an amount of flexibility for our staff members, for our certified librarians, people who are educated in this, to make a determination based on the selection criteria of what is appropriate for their students. And, you know, as much as I was expecting that to change, as we walked through the process, it was like, well, you know what, there's, there's an amount of flexibility that they, they need to have that, um, you know, I really want to allow people to be able to do their jobs and use their professional judgment um, to determine what belongs in our building. You know, we had talked about if, what if a book met a single criteria? And um, that doesn't pass a straight face test for me. I don't think, I don't think any of our librarians, I know that none of our librarians would have put a book in our library that only met one criteria. So I know it doesn't, it doesn't feel great, especially that particular part, because it's not super prescriptive, whereas the rest of it maybe is. Um, I still feel comfortable with it, because I know we hire good staff, and I know they're gonna make good choices. Um, and I'm gonna vote for the policy. So are we ready to vote? Okay, all those in favor. Opposed? Motion carries. Um, moving on, may I have a motion? I move to approve the second reading of IJJLR, Library Materials Selection Procedure. Second. Thank you. Public comment? Or discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Um, may I have another motion? I move to approve the second reading of policy IJJC, instructional materials selection. Second. Thank you. Public comment. Board discussion. All those in favor? Motion carries. All right, um, may I have another motion? I move to delete policy IJJ instructional and libraries materials selection dated 3-16-22. Second. Thank you, public comment, board discussion. All those in favor? Thank you, motion carries. And another motion. I move to approve the second reading of policy JICK, Bullying and Cyberbullying Prevention in Schools. Second. Thank you. Public comment. Board discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries. Go ahead. I move to approve the second reading of policy JICKR, Bullying and Cyberbullying Administrative Procedure. Second. Thank you. Public comment? Board discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries. And last one. 
I move to approve the second reading of policy ACAD hazing. Second. Public comment? Board discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries. And may I have a motion? I move to adjourn the regular meeting. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? We'll see you next week.